Hello lovely viewers and welcome to my latest devlog. I've done loads since the last one so uh, let me get on and talk you through it. The biggest thing I've probably done is I've created a second scene here. This is Trevor's bedroom and when he's indoors he uses this larger version of himself. Um, this is not a scaled up version of the one from outside. This is a separate version of Trevor and the indoor version of him and the outdoor version are in a group together called Trevor's Group. So I can target them both when I need to. So uh, here he is, larger Trevor. He walks slower when he's indoors and he can't jump when he's indoors. I, I don't have, I only have jump when he's outside. Uh, he's also got an idle animation now, as you can see. He's sort of gently breathing and his silly ears are going up and down. And that means that when he bumps into objects and things, he just snaps to his idle animation. Um, so there we go. Um, I actually had a bit of an accident with my animation file, so I had to redo his animation from scratch. And then I just spent half a day revisiting his design generally. He's got a slightly different face, uh, got a bit more detail in his clothing, uh, and the animation is a bit different now. And I'm really happy with him now. He didn't feel quite complete to me before. I wasn't 100%. You know, when you look at something and you think, hmm, there's just something missing here. It doesn't feel quite right to me, but he does now. Uh, it's not always easy to put your finger on how, what you think is missing from something, but um, uh, I'm, yeah, anyway, I'm happy with him now. Here he is walking in his bedroom and I discovered, <laughs> I, well, I've used for the first time a shape painter because uh, I had this circle in my artwork and it would, I was just can have a transparent PNG in GDevelop and I would put it at a higher Z order than him so it looks like he's walking under a light that makes his colour a bit lighter as he walks under it. And I thought, well, that's going to be a big PNG just to do this. Maybe there's another way. And so I looked into the shape painter, which I hadn't used before. And so it creates a circle when you run the game. So there it is. That's where it that's sort of where it begins. And the event that makes it is this, as simple as this a circle with a radius of 350 and um, I set the opacity for that uh, in the object itself so uh, where we are o opacity 40 there so um, and then when you run the game it creates it so I'm really pleased with that that worked quite well and I'll definitely use shape painter again for things like this um, I haven't used gdevelop's actual lighting um, sort of uh, engine or you know lighting objects because uh, I, I wanted this stylized kind of lighting you probably noticed from my artwork I like chunky geometric shapes and so on so I wanted this kind of stylized type of lighting the glow in the middle is just a photoshop um, blur that I've applied to a white circle so there's no real-time lighting going on here at all it's all just sort of uh, stylized it's all effects um, so we move over to his computer I had a laptop there before in an earlier version of my artwork, but I realized that if I want to set the game in the 90s, he's not going to have a, you know, a Surface Pro or whatever sitting on his desk. <laughs> um, so um, he's got an Amiga 1200 now for the older viewers who might remember those. Uh, that's what I had when I was a teenager. And uh, I, I watched a tutorial uh, from Victorious Games about using particles. And I, I thought it would be quite fun to have a, a screensaver that use these these floating particles um, and then I thought well hang on the particles are just gonna kind of unless I restrict them to the middle they're gonna go outside of the boundaries here and it's gonna look a bit strange so I I searched the extensions and I found a mask extension and what it does it uses a shape painter shape to create a mask so I've got an invisible square here and that is used as a mask for the particles so they look as if they're constrained by the edges of the screen so that's particles and I and I, I think I'm probably going to use particles in other areas of my game as well you can create so many lovely effects with them just by accident I was just sort of playing around and at one point I sort of accidentally made something that looked like you know fireflies or insects and I thought oh I could have those in a in a woodland scene or I could have something that looks like flies buzzing around a bin um a trash can for our American viewers <laughs> um so particles very cool I will definitely be using those again so that is Trevor's uh first indoor scene um I haven't implemented the dialogue system or the inventory yet to his indoor I'll have to do that and make sure that the dialogue system doesn't take too much space up when he's so much taller so I've got all that stuff to tweak and look at 
but I'm really pleased with it. Oh, and I haven't quite finished the artwork yet. When he's got other NPCs and friends and family, I will be able to put pictures of them in here. Um, but it's it's pretty in a pretty finished state. And just adding little things like this make it feel more alive. Um, but anyway, the other things I've been working on, I need to step outside to show you. We've stepped outside because I want to show you two new systems that I've been working on. The first one is context sensitive pop up icons. And what that means is when Trevor is near to something he can interact with, he's now going to get a pop up icon that shows him that he can interact with it. In this case, we've got a speech bubble because we can talk to this character. I'm not using collision checks, I'm using distance between. So when Trevor is 150 pixels away from this, uh, character or nearer than that this bubble will appear and also at that point he could initiate dialogue if he wanted to so the next icon is a pickup icon to show that you can collect an item and this is based on those fairground uh, metal claw grabber machines I don't know what they're called you know where you try to pick up a cuddly toy and the claw always drops it <laughs> and you keep putting more money in it and you, you can't get the cuddly toy. It's based on one of those. So um, anyway, if I hold down shift, Trevor walks 30% faster. That's a new thing. And he animates a little quicker as well so that it, it looks like it's he's not sliding along the floor. Um, when he gets near this front door, you get this uh, staircase animation happening. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an animated door icon eventually. And I'm only going to use this for actual staircases. And I'm probably going to do a staircase that looks as if somebody's walking down the stairs as well as up like this one. And lastly, we've got a look icon. There you go looks left and right and blinks and in the game Trevor would press a button now the dialogue system would appear and Trevor would describe what he's looking at and share his thoughts with the player and um, these animations they're all 10 frames a second and I think this one is probably about 12 frames this animation the stairs I think is only about five frames um, so it varies but they're all really tiny in terms of file size and so on um, it's quite interesting design challenge using only 10 frames a second and maybe just 20 frames to do something that's you know looks fairly smooth and, and decent uh, it's quite fun to do really having a limitation like that but I don't want these animations to end up really big and have loads and loads of frames, you know. So I kept them really simple. So that is my pop-up context-sensitive icon system. Crikey, what a mouthful. The second thing I wanted to talk about was how Trevor behaves when he starts dialogue. Um, you might have noticed before that when Trevor starts dialogue and he's facing the wrong way, he gets automatically... Uh, flipped to face the right way and I've done a little tutorial about how to do that it's just a simple event and two sub events and basically what it does is if um, if Trevor's x value is lower than the NPC and he's flipped ie he's facing left instead of the default right he will be have his flip removed and if he's got a higher x value and he isn't flipped, so he's facing right, which is his default, it will flip him uh, so that he's facing the NPC. And that, that worked really well. I was quite happy with that. But um, I decided that there was a bit of a problem with it that I wanted to fix. And, you know, the player could press a button now to start chatting to this NPC. And this looks really bad because Trevor's completely covering up this NPC. And mathematically, he might be facing the right way based on my event. But this system allows him to cover up the NPC and, and this isn't how people talk this looks really awkward and I've noticed in games over the years that when you launch dialogue with a character you will often see your little character walk away and then turn back and face the character so they're nicely positioned they look like they're having a conversation so no matter when the player presses uh, the talk button the little guy will walk away and turn around so that it looks like they're having an actual conversation and not sort of just sort of jump jumping on top of each other um, awkwardly. So that's what I've been working on. So if I press the talk button now, there we go. That's what he does now. Um, 
He walks away to a set distance and then he turns around and it covers all scenarios. Let me just skip my daft placeholder dialogue. So if he's too close, but he's facing the right way, he will turn away, walk away and turn back. If he's too close, but he's facing away, he'll walk away and turn back. So it takes care of all these different scenarios. Well, just two, <laughs> as it turns out. So here we go on the other side. If he's approaching from the left, he's too close, but he is facing the right way. He'll do that. Too close and facing the wrong way. He'll do that. And you'll also notice that the NPC turns as well. These placeholder NPCs are just looking at the camera. So I've given them these little arrows just to show what, what direction they're looking because they're not really looking in a direction. Um, but they turn as well now. So if Trevor approaches from the right now, his position gets adjusted. And then lastly, the NPC's direction uh, left or right is adjusted as well whether they're flipped or not so in my game you're going to have characters that are looking left or looking right and this behavior will take care of uh, making sure that Trevor and the NPC are actually looking at each other when they're talking now this was a little tricky to do because when Trevor is talking to somebody or when he's got his inventory open his platform behavior and all his controls I've got set up all get disabled so that people can't sort of walk around and jump during dialogue or when the inventory is open. But that meant that I couldn't use any platformer behavior type stuff to move him to this position and do all that stuff that I've just shown you. So instead, I used a tween. I gave him the tween behavior and I just animate him on the X axis and I uh, play his walk animation at, at a slower speed um, for about half a second. And then he flips to the right direction. The tween is removed and his idle animation plays and then the NPC gets flipped to the right direction as well. So that's how that works. So I'm really pleased with how that turned out and I just think it looks a lot more professional than um, two characters overlapping each other so you can't even see them. Even though I'm going to have portraits with facial expressions and things in and players will probably be paying attention to this part of the screen, I still wanted this to look nice down here. So I'm just it's just a bit of refinement. Um, I think it looks a bit more professional. Anyway, I'm going to finish the video by talking about a game design document that I've been working on and how important it is to sometimes step back from the micro stuff from the details and look at the bigger picture. Another thing I've been thinking a lot about recently is my overall game design. I've been spending a lot of time on individual systems, you know, the dialogue system, the inventory, various other bits and pieces. I've been very focused on the micro, on the small details, and I've lost sight of the overall game design. And when I started out on this, I did obviously have a basic idea of the sort of game I want to make. I had an idea of a little story, uh, some of the characters involved, what the player would be doing. But I hadn't really sat down and written a proper game design plan, a kind of game design document that people often call it. And I was finding that I was getting a bit lost. I was running out of things to do, which I know sounds crazy because I've got lots to do. But I hadn't zoomed out mentally and kind of got a firm sense of what my game is going to look like overall. So a couple of weekends ago, that's what I did. And I sat down and I wrote um, out a proper plan. What is the player going to be doing in my game? The minute to minute gameplay it's often described as. What's, my, what's the player going to be doing? Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be interesting? And second, what is the player going to be aiming for overall? What, what's the point of the game? What, what's the overall kind of objective of your game? So when I answered those two questions, that enabled me to really kind of flesh out a proper plan for my game. And I was also able to draw a map of the town that Trevor's going to be exploring. Because once you know what the player's going to be doing, and once you know what the goals in the game are, you can then decide on what locations you need and what NPCs you need and what bespoke interactions you need to design. So everything comes from those questions, at least I, I found. 
so I wrote this game design document and that sounds really sort of far more impressive than it really is. A game design document doesn't need to be some sort of leather bound manuscript. <laughs> it can just be a bullet list maybe to start with, but you definitely need a plan. Um, and I was meandering along without a plan, having a lot of fun for sure, you know, focusing on individual systems. But I realized that I had a collection of systems that felt quite polished and good and I was happy with, but no game for them to belong to no clear sense of the game that they would belong to so yeah I spent some time thinking about my overall game design and that's been quite an important lesson to me and now I've got just a huge list of things to do and the way forward is nice and clear now I've also been thinking about knowing when to cut content from your game when you know that something isn't quite working right. I'm not talking technically working, you know, you might have a system up and running that works very well and it's all programmed nicely and it works the way you want, but it, it just doesn't feel right. It's, it doesn't fit with the game, it, it doesn't add anything to the project. And so I had that problem recently and I, I had this idea where Trevor was gonna have an imaginary friend I thought it'd be quite cool that he had an imaginary friend that he could talk to whenever he liked and the imaginary friend would act as a kind of journal and it would point Trevor in the right direction if he was stuck and it would pop up and make observations about the world and the people around him. But I suddenly realised, well, if Trevor has an imaginary friend who has knowledge that Trevor doesn't have, that suggests a supernatural element to the game. And I wasn't planning on doing a supernatural game. This is this is a game that's uh, set in the 90s. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be quite whimsical and, and, and sweet, but it's it's kind of grounded in our reality. It's regular people with regular concerns and day jobs and things. There wasn't going to be ghosts and ghoulies and vampires and things. So I made the decision to cut the idea. And all I'd done so far was an illustration of this character, this invisible friend, and I'd written some notes about it. But um, so it wasn't too much to remove. I hadn't spent any time putting it into GDevelop. It was still difficult though. You know, when you're attached to an idea that you like, it's quite hard sometimes to make the choice to chop it. But what I've done is I've, I've, I'm going to save that idea for another day, for another project. Um, but it doesn't work for this project. It's not what I wanted to do. So yeah, that's been another lesson, just knowing when to cut something that isn't working. Is the thing that you're working on, does it enhance your game? Is it, is it, does it fit your game? Or are you just perhaps adding bloat? Are you adding things that don't quite work? So I think knowing what to cut out can be as important probably as knowing what to put in and it will keep your game more focused, focused on the good stuff, the stuff that really works, the stuff that serves the overall project. So that's what I've been doing and thinking about since my last devlog. I will be back soon with another video, probably a tutorial. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching and good day to you.